I'd like to introduce you now to Rosalind Lapeer, who is here to talk about traditional ecological knowledge. Rosalind is an award-winning indigenous writer and ethnobotanist with a BA in physics and a PhD in environmental history. She studies the intersection of traditional ecological knowledge learned from elders and the academic study of environmental history. Rosalind grew up on the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana. She splits her time between living in the heart of Salish County in Missoula, Montana, and the Blackfeet Reservation. Rosalind has written two books, a Blackfeet language lexicon, several book chapters, academic journal articles, and dozens of general audience articles and commentaries. Her writing has appeared in The Conversation, The Washington Post, High Country News, Grist, and other venues. She's currently working on her third book, Plants That Purify the Natural and Supernatural History of Smudging. As an activist, she advocates for both indigenous and Western science-based decision making. She was one of the organizers of the March for Science in 2017, the largest day of science advocacy in history with over 1 million participants in 600 cities worldwide. She also co-authored the Indigenous Science Statement. Rosalind is an Associate Professor of Environmental Studies at the University of Montana, where she received the 2018 George M. Dennison Presidential Faculty Award for Distinguished Accomplishment at the University of Montana. Please join me in welcoming Rosalind Lapeer. Well, first of all, I want to um, thank the organizers for inviting me to this conference and inviting me to speak with you today. Um, and um, I'm just going to share some um, uh, information that I have learned over the time that I have been doing research um, related both to ethnobotany and kind of ethnohistory um, and the uh, kinds of research that I do and I'm interested in. And um, I also, as was mentioned, I also write um, a lot of sort of short pieces for the general audience. Um, I started doing that a couple of years ago um, because I realized that there are lots of folks who don't quite understand sometimes what academics do and especially don't understand what scientists do. So I'm, I've, become, I've learned that this is kind of important um, for folks to um, play that role of being kind of a science communicator as well. And um, one of the pieces that I wrote um, a couple of years ago was when uh, the Standing Rock um, uh, situation was happening in North Dakota. And this was a piece where I was attempting to explain why uh, both um, policymakers and folks who um, dealt with and worked with like the EPA and did EISs and that sort of thing really needed to take into account um, indigenous religion and indigenous religious practice and sort of adding that to um, their understanding of decision making. And so um, it's something that I have written a lot about. But anyway, so I ended up writing this piece um, that was in the conversation and then it ended up also in the Washington Post. And, um, and then it got shared around lots of other places. Um, but it was something that uh, when Standing Rock was occurring, a lot of people, and especially journalists, so I got a lot of calls from journalists asking about, hey, what the heck's going on there? Um, but journalists, when they went out there, they were shocked, like super shocked, that indigenous people were religious and that indigenous people saw things always through a religious lens. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today, is just sort of like how indigenous people think about the world differently, especially how they interact with the natural world and think about the natural world um, differently. So um, just to briefly introduce myself, um, I, on my mother's side of the family, I'm Blackfeet. I'm an enrolled member of the Blackfeet tribe. I grew up on the Blackfeet reservation. And I identif identify primarily as Blackfeet only because um, that's where I was um, raised. Um, I'm also Métis. So um, some people in the United States know what Métis is. Everybody in Canada knows what Métis is. But Métis is basically an ethnic group that is a mixture of a lot of different folks, European and indigenous. Um, and in my case, uh, my family is a mix of French, um, Ojibwe, and Nakota. And this is a picture of my grandmother. And um, I actually officially sort of apprenticed and trained with my grandmother for about 20 years in ethnobotany. 
And a lot of times folks thinks, think of ethnobotany or um, sometimes traditional knowledge as being something that gets passed down to children. And at least for the Blackfeet, we actually have an apprentice system. Um, it does not get passed down to tr children. You have to wait until you're an adult. And when you become an adult, either you ask and say, hey, I want to learn about that. And then you become an apprentice of somebody. Or in, like in my case, somebody says, hey, you're going to learn that. <laughs> so <laughs> in my particular case, I really was not particularly that interested in plants. Um, but my family was like, we need somebody to learn this. You're the one. Um, so I spent a, a good amount of time um, spending time with my grandmother, um, one of my oldest aunts, and then several elders um, in the Blackfeet community learning about ethnobotany. Um, OK. so. Um, the research that I do, um, because I am a, an environmental historian and I work in environmental studies, and I do, as, as I was mentioning at our table, you know, environmental studies is kind of this, you know, odd blend of like environmental science and social science and humanities, sometimes like, you know, theology and religion, um, and so we kind of do this like odd mixture of stuff and teach students everything. Um, but uh, one of the things I'm really interested in is what is uh, the relationship between humans and the natural world, right? That's kind of the big overarching question. But I'm really interested in what is the relationship between indigenous people and the natural world. And um, so my research is looking at that. I'm also interested in activism, as was mentioned. Um, and so I've written about activism, too. Um, and I still kind of do both. I dabble in both. Um, of looking at how and why people choose to act, right? When do they make that decision that I'm going to do this? Um, and so I've written um, a few things, including an entire book on activism. Um, and then I also am interested in how people think about the natural world. OK, so um, one of the phrases that gets used often when we think about this relationship between indigenous people and the natural world is that indigenous people have traditional ecological knowledge. And I'm assuming that almost everybody in this audience has heard that phrase before. And it does now kind of have a definition, a, a scholarly definition um, that was, um, that, that's been around probably for about 20 years now, which is that traditional ecological knowledge includes three things. It includes knowledge, practice, and belief. And knowledge just means that a particular group has knowledge about something, right? About a plant, about an animal, about an ecosystem, about weather patterns. They know about one thing, or more than one thing, but they know about something that um, then they practice, right? So then pr the practice part is how do they use that knowledge, right? So they use that knowledge in particular ways. But then the added thing to TEK that's different is that indigenous people also see things through a religious lens. So belief is always part of that. And so one of the things I would argue is um, there's also phrases now like local knowledge um, or indigenous knowledge where people are looking at how people who have lived in one place for a very long time you know, learn about especially the ecosystems of those areas. So for example, I'm from Montana. There are now people you know, who are fifth, sixth generation farmers and ranchers who've lived on the northern Great Plains of Montana. They know the ecosystem of the northern Great Plains of Montana because they've been there for a really long time. But that's local knowledge um, because they have the knowledge and the practice, but they usually don't have a belief system behind that, whereas indigenous people um, have that added belief system. So, um, one of the things that I became really interested in when I was starting to write and think about this was as I was looking at um, how indigenous people or how different people viewed the natural world, um, I was not seeing that much scholarship that was kind of leaning towards the belief system side. There's lots of stuff that um, you, there's a lot of scholars who will tell you about how indigenous people related to bison, or how they related to sturgeon, or how they related to you know, uh, different uh, plants and animal species. But g digging deeper into kind of the religious aspects of that, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, scholarship that is really lacking in that. And so one of the things I was interested in doing is myself, at least, um, kind of digging deeper into that. 
And oops. so uh, the um, book that I just wrote about a year ago, or came out a year ago, um, was looking at the Blackfeet tribe. And so one of the things I was interested in doing is one, I have a very strong um, opinion about you know, studying yourself first. I know that most scholars have the opposite, right? You're supposed to be objective, study somebody else. I'm like, you know what? No one's gonna study my tribe. No one's gonna study my community. I'm gonna study my community. Um, so I wrote a book about what, how the Blackfeet um, think about the natural world and um, what is their relationship to the natural world. And uh, it turned out to be much more a book about religion and religious practice and religious understanding. Um, because uh, I believe that most, as I said, most indigenous people view sort of the natural world through an indigenous lens. Um, and as I was mentioning to my table, so, so I found out a month ago that this book that I just published last year has won two book awards, which I'll find out. It's, it's not public yet, but now it will be. It's on video. <laughs> It'll, it'll be public tomorrow, actually. <laughs> um, and I'm a finalist for a third other book award, which I'll find out on Saturday, whether, I, whether the book won that or not. Okay, so one of the things I was interested in talking about today is what makes something sacred. One of the things you hear often uh, in, uh, in uh, the news or within indigenous communities is the word sacred. Right? It's an English word that can mean a lot of different things. And so one of the things when I started doing some of my research is I wanted to sort of understand like when people were saying something was sacred, what exactly did that mean? And of course, in most indigenous communities, what you need to do first is you actually need to find out what the word in that language is. Um, it's, I think it's really, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother talk. I think it's really important to understand indigenous languages and understand sort of where what those translations are. Um, but when I was looking at um, some of the places that I was um, doing research on um, and talking to elders and talking to knowledge keepers, they would translate things into, well, that's sacred. Well, that's sacred. Well, that's sacred, right? And I was like, okay, you guys keep using that same English word for everything? Does it really mean that, or what, what's going on here? So one of the things I was interested in doing is just sort of kind of creating my own rubric of what they mean by that. Um, so I'm just gonna go over that a little bit and then um, talk about some other stuff. So what, why, why is something sacred? So in most um, indigenous communities, and um, in the Blackfeet in specific, you know, the sacred is divided up into kind of two different um, uh, it, 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 it is created in two different ways. It's either one created by the divine or created by the supernatural, or it's created by humans, and then it becomes sanctified by the divine. And so there's always a distinction between something that's sacred that is divinely created and something that is sacred that is humanly created. Um, and those are different places and different spaces. But often, again, when you're talking to an indigenous community or indigenous people sometimes, it becomes kind of this monolithic, that's sacred, right? So um, in terms of the divine, um, I divided it up into sort of three different um, types of sacredness. And if you think about it, think about a target, right? So there's the center and then kind of an outer ring and an outer ring. In the center ring is places where supernatural entities live places of creation, um, places where supernatural entities die, right, or are buried. So it's not a human that's there, it's a supernatural that's there. Um, so in those cases, there are places on the landscape that indigenous people set aside, and they say, we don't go there because that's where somebody lives. We don't go there because that's where somebody has passed away, and by somebody they mean a supernatural entity. So there are places on the landscape that are known and used by their non-use, right? No one goes there. Oh, that one's, the second one's already up, sorry. Um, and the second one is sort of the outer ring, right? So here's the very sacred place that nobody goes to, and then there's the outer ring outside of that where it is places where people will go near it, 
and they'll go near a sacred place and they'll pray there, or they'll go near the sacred place and they'll have a vision quest there, um, or they'll have shrines or sacred um, uh, pilgrimages that are near that sacred site. Those are also places that are places where people visit. They don't stay there, they don't live there, um, but they are places that are mapped out on the landscape um, as important. Um, and then the last one is, sacred, is places where people collect resources that are used for religious rituals and ceremonies. So there are specific places where they're gonna collect certain plants, certain animals, certain natural elements that are used in specific religious ceremonies. Again, those are places that are visited, people don't live there, um, and people uh, don't stay there, but um, they become places where, for those of you who are kind of GIS map folks, um, when you look at old maps of um, indigenous territory, they're gonna say, we lived here, we collected resources here, we went hunting here, and oh, there's this place over here that is not on the map. A lot of times the place that's not on the map is usually somebody's sacred lands or holy lands, and sometimes people don't talk about it, and sometimes they will. So I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples. So this is in Montana. It's kind of on the border of um, Montana and uh, Alberta, and it's now in Glacier National Park. So this is Chief Mountain. So Chief Mountain is a sacred site to not just the Blackfeet, but to several other tribes um, that are in Canada. And for the Blackfeet at least, um, they consider it the home to Thunder, who is a supernatural being. And um, because it's the home of a supernatural being, there's a lot of religious restrictions, including you don't go there. You don't climb it, you don't go near it. Um, unfortunately, because it's on Glacier National Park, people climb it all the time, right? So this is a, uh, an issue for the tribe um, that has not been resolved. For the tribe, though, they'll go near it, right? So it becomes a place where if you're within a certain um, boundary of, uh, of Chief Mountain, you're gonna see all kinds of different sites, prayer sites, vision quest sites, et cetera, because of the place where people will go visit um, that area. Um, and then the third um, example I had given was places where people go and collect um, particular resources. So there are certain sites um, along both the Musselshell River, um, the Yellowstone River and the uh, Missouri River in Montana where people go and collect, for example, um, freshwater mussels, which are used for religious practice. So the other um, types of sacred areas are areas that we would consider um, created by humans, right? So the first site um, that humans would set aside and not go to, and again, think about kind of that idea of the target, um, there are sites that are related to human death. So today we have those sites too, right? Cemeteries. Um, we have cemeteries, we bury people there. We don't live there, we visit. Um, uh, but they become sites that are sanctified um, and sacred uh, to us. So uh, places that are um, related to human death, um, sometimes in the case uh, of uh, uh, indigenous history um, related also to massacre sites, um, then becomes these set-aside areas where people don't go to. Uh, the second one, again, if you think about the kind of target, uh, there are sites that are places that become shrines. And there are a lot of shrines across the Northern Great Plains uh, that were created by humans where people go there um, to pray. They also have pilgrimage, so there's um, shrines where you would go on a pilgrimage and you'd go from shrine to shrine to shrine to shrine, the same way they do in Europe, right? Um, with some of the saints, uh, uh, the, the walking uh, trips for saints history. Um, and then there are also um, sites that are built. So the easiest example to explain that is, is sweat lodges. So sweat lodges are something that are built, they're used for religious practice, and then they're left and they're basically left to um, then disintegrate and go back to the earth. They stay a sacred area while they are disintegrating and once they kind of 
disappear, then it's no longer a sacred area. So it's kind of a temporary um, sacred site. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. So this is an area, um, again, in Montana, the Marias River, the Marias River um, flows into the Missouri River. And there's an area there, um, the Blackfeet called this the Bear River, not the Marias. Um, the, there was a, a massacre there in uh, 1870, uh, which is called the Baker Massacre. And Baker um, went in and in an early morning raid uh, killed the, um, basically uh, killed uh, several hundred women and children um, because the men were not there. And since that time, that site has become an area where nobody goes to. And even though settlers moved in, um, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, and now this is an area where there's a lot of ranching and farming, um, even um, non-natives do not um, have any permanent sites here. And so this has just, in the last couple of years, been, cre been turned into a state park um, as, an, as a method of sort of conserving um, that particular site. So that's an area that the Blackfeet would not go to. Um, near this particular site, there are some shrines um, that are related to religious practice and prayer. And then this is, um, again, the example of sweat lodges. So sweat lodges, once they were used, um, the, the coverings would be taken off and be taken with them, and the wooden structures that, um, they, had, that they had been built with um, would just be left um, to the elements and left to disintegrate. But this was done with a lot of other um, types of uh, buildings that were created particularly for religious rituals or religious ceremonies. So in, of course in Minnesota there's lots of these places as well, right? There's a lot of places in Minnesota that are both places that would you be considered that were created by the divine and then there's also places that are considered created by humans. Um, and a lot of times, um, at least from my own personal um, uh, research when I've done research on this, and especially when you're looking at maps, a lot of times those don't appear on maps because they're kind of this gray area over here, right? Um, you can find all this other information about um, how people used the landscape, but when, a, when landscape is not used, and usually it's not used because it's used by religious, you know, for religious reasons, um, it always doesn't sort of end up on maps. Um, last summer, I was, had the great fortune of spending the summer here. Um, I was at uh, McAllister College, and they had an NEH program on um, the study of world religions, and so I participated in that. And as part of that, we went and visited with all these different religious traditions that are here in Minnesota. And we also um, spent about a half of a week going and visiting a lot of different sites um, that were important to um, primarily the Dakota, um, but also a couple of Ojibwe sites as well. OK. so. One of the things that I do, like I said, I, I'm, I've now, um, in addition to sort of writing um, what I'd consider academic or scholarly work, I also like to write um, stuff that is, uh, that is for the general audience. So this is an article that I wrote a couple years ago when the impending crisis, uh, which has not quite become a crisis yet in Montana, um, with the zebra mussels happened. And, um, there's a local magazine there called the Montana Naturalist, which is part of the Montana uh, Natural History Association. And they have this little magazine that comes out. And they've asked me to write several things over the past couple of years. And this was one of them. And so one of the things we wanted to share was why mussels, not the invasive kind, um, but why mussels were important to um, tribal communities and how the connection between kind of the science um, or the, e the ecology of mussels and what they do and the mythology and, and legends around mussels um, and what that, uh, those stories tell us and sort of how they, com how they intersect with each other. And so um, this, in this particular case, the Blackfeet have a, um, a story about where um, freshwater mussels come from, how they got used, um, and it's kind of interesting because it is very close to what they actually do um, scientifically. 
And so that was one of the things I wanted to share about how that we can see these different connections. But one of the things that the Blackfeet also did was they tried to protect the sites where um, mussels lived. Um, are there any folks out here who study freshwater mussels? Oh good, I can say whatever I want. No. <laughs> so, out in Montana, so, so out in our neck of the woods on the Missouri River, you know, um, mussels uh, have a tendency to be born, live, and die all in the same area of about the size of this table. <laughs> they don't go very far from where they live. Um, and so because of that, um, if you don't protect these sites, uh, it is possible for them um, to become endangered. Um, and this was something that the Blackfeet had been doing for years. They were protecting all of these different sites where, where freshwater mussels were, which then changed, you know, fast forward in history. And now we've got dams, now we've got silt, we, now we've got all kinds of issues um, on the Missouri River. But it was something that historically the um, Blackfeet had thought of and had been part of, um, again, using the phrase T-E-K, right, was part of their traditional ecological knowledge and something that they had thought about um, and uh, tried to protect. So um, one of the things I wanted, again, kind of to emphasize was I think that it is really hard uh, in our work uh, especially um, folks like me who are in environmental studies, environmental science, to really look at and understand um, how indigenous people think about the world around them um, without seeing it through a re their religious lens. And I think this is also true with a lot of other religions around the world. Um, one of the things that I've learned from um, thinking about and um, learning about different religions um, and religious practice around the world is that we're increasingly seeing kind of this connection between religious practice, religious understanding, and then also kind of the ecological practice and ecological understanding. And I think it's one of those things that personally I feel like, you know, we need to take a step back when we're working with communities and ask them how they actually see the natural world and how do they view the natural world through their own kind of cultural lens or religious lens. So thank you for being a very nice audience. So I guess we're gonna have questions now. All right, the first question, how do native tribes feel about ecological restoration projects on sacred sites? So I would answer that question first. It depends on what they, what they mean by sacred site. So again, is it a site that they view um, again, looking at that kind of simple rubric that I had, you know, is it something that they think is uh, a site that was created by the divine, or is it something that is a human-related um, site? And that's, that would be the first thing, is trying to figure that out. The other thing is, chances are um, they are definitely interested in ecological restoration. I don't think I've ever worked with a tribal group that's not interested in that. But I think that coming, trying to come at it, from, again, from their point of view as much as possible, find out what, um, in terms of the restoration project that's being done, um, have people heard the, heard the phrase cultural keystone species in this group? So there's been some work on, there's a phrase called cultural keystone species. So it, instead of a species being a keystone species, it's something where a particular um, group is using a particular, um, uh, you know, a particular object, plant, animal, natural element um, that's important to them and important to their culture. So that particular thing becomes kind of the keystone of the ecosystem that they are, the humans are a part of. So for example, the mussel shell um, is important to the Blackfeet, so therefore they protect it, right? Um, so that becomes a keystone to them. That, the mussel shell is definitely not a keystone species on the Missouri River. So when you're looking at ecological restoration, ask them what are those um, parts of their ecosystem that are important to them um, and are part of their culture that they use, and then um, tap into that and connect it back to um, their important places. And, uh, and people will respond positively 
Great. Next question. How can I include respect traditional ecological knowledge in my water work without committing cultural appropriation? That's a tough one. <laughs> So, I mean, I think that the best way to do that is try to work with tribal communities um, as much as possible. Find a, try to find people that you can collaborate with and have it more of a partnership um, than something where um, you're going in and sort of telling people their culture. Um, I've had that happen to me where people have said, Roz, let me tell you about the Blackfeet. And I'm like, dude, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I know about the Blackfeet. <laughs> so yeah, try to avoid that. <laughs> try, try. What do they call it? Um, like mansplaining. Yeah. But that happens. But that happens not not with mansplaining. But it it happens with like, you know, I, I know more about indigenous people than you do. Yeah. Okay. First of all, you might actually know more, but just don't act like you know more um, when you're in those situations. Because there are some there are some places where. Um, because of colonization, right? Because of history, because of colonization, because of conquest, you know, there are places where indigenous people really are kind of struggling to um, restore their own cultural knowledge um, and their own cultural practices. So, anyway. great, good tip. <laughs> I recently learned the Dakota notion of Bedote, I don't know if I said that right, as sacred places at the gathering of waters are confluence of streams. Can you help us understand the sacred nature of the confluence? That one I can't answer. Because I, I, I mean, I, can, I think I might be able to answer that, but um, I'm not Dakota, so I, they have a different idea of that than I would have an idea of that. So, okay. skip to the next Skip, one. next. <laughs> How can the concept of sacred waters be instilled upon to non-indigenous people? Well, I, I'm, this particular question, I think it, it, it doesn't even have to be water. It could be anything, right? And I think that this is something where um, just having respect in general for any religious practice, it doesn't have to be indigenous, any religious practice is, again, as I mentioned um, a few minutes ago, you know, just always take that into account whatever community you're dealing with, um, chances are they have some sort of either religious practice or a cultural practice that's important to them. And if it's important to them, then you need to know why it's important and how it's important and be respectful of that. And it, def it doesn't necessarily have to be about water. It can be about a lot of um, other different things. So. How do we work with native communities for whom religion is central to their function while we generally believe in a strong separation of church and state, religion and secular? Yeah, I don't know, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's, uh, native people are very religious. Uh, religion is part of people's daily lives. Um, uh, there are, again, other religious groups that are also very religious. And, um, and so that's just something that, uh, in terms of the way uh, decisions are made, uh, depending on indigenous groups, some indigenous groups, um, the way their communities are organized and even their governmental systems are organized are almost like a theocracy more than a democracy. And so when decisions are made, um, oftentimes, uh, a religious leader is going to be added to the decision making, and the political leader is going to be added to the decision making. So you always have to be reminded that if you're talking to a political leader and you're making decisions and you're signing agreements and et cetera, just wait because that religious leader is going to be going, "Hey, you guys just made that agreement." Uh-uh. Um, so. When you're at the table with indigenous people, make sure that you are always speaking with a political leader and a religious leader. That's what I would say. Um, because um, religion is just so um, important and so sort of enmeshed in indigenous life. All right, talk to us about gender differences in the indigenous community around water values and activism and traditional ecological knowledge. Okay, that, that'll take another two hours. No. 
Well, yeah, there's definitely gender differences. <laughs> and it depends on the community. So again, the, there's community differences about this. Um, I would argue that the majority of activism and a majority of leadership um, around environmental issues is um, organized by women. Uh, one of the, and, and to not even talk about um, indigenous communities for just one second, um, as was mentioned earlier, you know, I, I was one of the organizers for the March for Science. And when we started organizing that, there was one guy and six women, right? And this, you know, because it got it started after the um, Women's March, um, we eventually had a national um, steering committee that had two men and seven women. And so the National March for Science was primarily organized by women. Um, most of the leadership across um, the United States and the world were women. And I think that in we see the same thing in indigenous communities when it comes to um, environmental issues, um, when it comes to um, issues that people think are kind of, you know, the phrase, like the bread and butter issues, you're gonna see women there um, helping uh, organize uh, those things. But having said that, there are definitely um, different gender roles and gender, um, uh, yeah, gender roles within indigenous communities, and they're different from indi indigenous community to indigenous community. And then indigenous communities also have a much more fluid idea of gender. So we also have things like two spirit, um, non gender, um, and so different communities don't have just the binary. Um, some communities have multiple gender. Um, identities that are part of that community. So when we talk about gender, it's not just the binary. Um, so I'm, now I'm just babbling. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I, I would just say yes, it's important, uh, and, uh, and find out from the community that you're, you're uh, dealing with. Sorry. Good. No, that was good. Thank Next question. Western religions generally view stewardship as exerting control over resources. Is stewardship the same thing in your cultural view, or how is it different with indigenous views? Yeah, so again, that depends on, that depends on the indigenous group, because every um, group has a different um, religious practice. Uh, but I would argue that the majority of indigenous um, groups do not have the do not have the tradition of stewardship um, as it is in the Bible, and um, and, it, and it depends on the religious tradition. Um, uh, for the Blackfeet, we have a different view about the way the world is organized and the cosmology, and depending on indigenous groups, they're also going to have their own cosmology um, and the way the world works. And um, so that's kind of the beginning point, right? Try to understand the cosmology um, so that you can see what the relationships are. Um, a lot of indigenous people have kinship relationships with the natural world. Um, we do with the Blackfeet as well. We have a lot of um, stories where there are humans who marry non-humans and then there are kind of half human, half non-human um, relatives that then get created, and so part of our relationship with the natural world has to do with the fact that we're actually related to a particular thing um, versus kind of the stewardship model where you're, um, where you were um, instructed um, by God to, um, uh, to act in a certain way. All right. How do you recommend mediating the issues of multi multiple cultures using sacred sites in urban are areas for multiple purposes? Yeah, that's hard. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, and it's really hard, because there are going to be sites where multiple tribes may all claim the same space as um, part of their kind of sacred landscape. And um, I would just say that there's going to be a lot of negotiating. There's going to be a lot of negotiating going on. Um, and I know here, uh, wait, I won't even say in here. Um, Montana, <laughs> you know, in Montana there are places like the Chief Mountain that I showed you, um, which is a Blackfeet site, but it's also a site for several other tribes as well who think about it differently, um, uh, who have uh, different religious practices there. 
right now, that particular area is being preserved because it's part of Glacier National Park, right? So we really don't have to worry about um, like resource extraction or any other kinds of issues because it's in the park. Um, we do have to worry about sites that are not in the park. And, um, and one of my, this is my own personal feeling about this, there are some tribes who, because of good fortune, they may have the funding, they may have the attorneys, they may have the geologists and the geographers, right, who are able to assert greater authority over certain sites. And I personally, this is my own personal, <laughs> I, I just say more power to them. Because if for some reason my particular tribe can't, um, assert some authority over a particular area, but another tribe can because they have, you know, they have the resources to do it. As long as the bottom line is the preservation, conservation, or the restoration of that site, um, then I think it's great. But that's my own personal feelings. I, I think it gets very complicated when there's a lot of tribes who have sacred landscapes that overlap each other. That's, like I said, a lot of negotiation going mm -hmm. on. Great, okay, I think this will be our last question. What is the most important thing for an atheist to understand about traditional ecological knowledge? <laughs> well, this is, it, it, I think it's important for an atheist to understand about all, I mean, there's religious practices around the world. Um, it, there, every culture in the world has some sort of religion um, in, you know, some more important than others. And um, I think it's just kind of respect for those ways and um, try to understand those ways as best you can. But I mean, I think the bottom line is respect because I know um, because I work in an academic circles, you know, the majority of academics are not religious. Um, and, but when you go into certain communities, there are communities that are extremely religious and you just have to sort of, you know, learn and accept um, what, I shouldn't say accept, learn and be respectful um, to those, the way that they view the world. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's across the board. So not just with TEK, but with any religion or religious practice. So. Great, thank you, Rosalind, for being Thanks. here today.